Welcome back to the podcast. Today, we've got a very special guest coming in from New York City, New York. She is a multifaceted entrepreneur and coach with a book and a great backstory and so much, so much information. So I'm going to read a quick biography, and then we're going to dive into everything we can extract from her in 45 minutes time. So Barbara Sloan is an author of the book Tipped, the life-changing guide to financial freedom for waitresses, bartenders, strippers, and all other service professionals. A homeless teen who danced for dollars and definitely did not graduate from college, she is now a personal finance expert and money coach that spent two decades working in every imaginable position in the service industry all over the country. In addition to owning and running a badass women-owned construction company in the heart of Manhattan, she helps tipped workers achieve financial freedom like she did. She is passionate about all of the amazing aspects of tipped work and passionate about all of the terrible aspects of tipped work. She lives in New York City with her wife of 10 years, an esteemed corporate finance exec, and together they are a couple of adorable money nerds who point out every dog they see. Barbara, thanks for being on. <laughs> thanks, Andy. You did a great job of reading that. It's still Friday. <laughs> oh, my. How are you? I'm so great. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to talk with you. Oh, this is a blast. I've been really looking forward to talking with you for weeks. I think we scheduled this a while back. And so I read your bio. I looked at your book. I've been meaning to read it. I'm super excited. Why don't we start with just who you are, what you do every day? What is life like right now? Yeah, awesome. I love starting starting to where we are right now. So most people who meet me today know me as an owner um, in a high-end, women-owned construction company in the heart of New York City. Um, I build those really luxury apartments that you would call like housing porn. <laughs> love it. I've been doing, yeah, I've been doing high-end renovations for almost 10 years in the city and have been doing construction for over 20 years. For the last 20 years, I've worked two career paths pretty much in tandem. I've worked construction in the day and service industry at night, or I, as I like to say, dirt in the day and dirty in the evening. Oh my, so, love that. <laughs> yeah, and so sometimes I only work service industry jobs. So I would say full-time, I started working in the service industry at the age of 20, I moved out to California. And from there, the next 10 years were me moving around the country. I loved the adventure of like checking out new cities and trying out new places. And so I would move to a new city and I would get a service industry job because it was pretty easy to get a service industry job quickly. Um, and yeah. And then once I got settled, I would find a construction job. And so that's really what I was doing until 2013 when my wife and I moved to New York City, I got two jobs. The first job was Coyote Ugly, which I don't know if people know the movie, but um, it's a bar where you sing and dance on the bar, you hit your patrons, you get girls to take their bras off. It's a very good time. Um, and then I got a, a job working on Wall Street for an unregulated market. So it was part trading floor, part independent sales organization where they were selling usurious loan products, which is basically like loan sharking. And it was a huge education for me, not only on the markets, but on predatory lending, on financial services. And I lasted about six months there until our third trader got shipped off to rehab. And I was like, this is really toxic. I think I need to go back to bars and construction. And from there, I ended up getting a job at the construction company that I now own. I was employee number three. I was tasked with setting up an HR department. Um, and a benefit system. And I had never had benefits before working in the service industry. So I didn't know what a 401k was. I had no idea how to set up a paid time off policy. I had never had health insurance. So I was getting to deep dive all of these benefits and figure out how they supported the you know wealth and health of an employee. And then on the other side, we were working for those really high end, high net worth clients and I was talking with them on a daily basis about their million dollar budgets and kind of seeing their mindset behind how they thought about that decision making. And that was sort of the aha moment where I was like, oh, it's these benefits and this mindset that help people build wealth. And this is the reason that everyone in the service industry that I know as my peers have not been able to get ahead. And so I was like, 
you know, I started deep diving personal finance content and realized that no one was talking to service industry professionals. And I had a lot of imposter syndrome and I was just like, well, you know, I, it can't possibly be me who writes a book on personal finance. I have zero college. I have zero credentials. I am. And, but then, you know, after you look at people who've been in this industry for decades and they're not helping these people and there's a reason for that. And so I was like, well, I should, I should write the book I wish I had had. And that's sort of what led me to writing Tipped. It seems like economic forces of the past few years have really brought this to the forefront, probably because of people outside of the service industry, because there are so many people that now have a side hustle, freelancing, gig working, even driving for Uber. They've never considered what personal health insurance costs or what it's like to pay self-employment taxes when you don't have Medicare and Social Security removed for you from your employer. So it's it's amazing that things like this exist because I work with tons of restaurants and bar people and I'm really interested in the genesis of your book and talking about people who work in tip driven environments. I know it's it's an awesome name, but it's the core income for a lot of people. And in some states there are I, I have a friend who lives in Idaho, and I remember at one point he was getting paid like 5 or $6 an hour plus tips, and he was making you know a, a real living, but the guarantee was so freaking small. And when you live and work in industries that are based on not even a commission but a tip-oriented income, is that really where this all started with people that have this variable income that could be super high or low on a given day or week? Yeah, the history of tipping is super interesting. So it actually got brought over by Americans who were visiting Europe, and they thought it was very aristocratic. And so they they brought it back and they started tipping their help. And um, it didn't get popularized until post-slavery, when formerly enslaved people were freed and, and entering the workforce. Employers at that time realized that they could use this tipping loophole, and they could continue to profit off the backs of their black, brown, minority, uneducated workers. Most of those workers were in restaurants and working the railroads. So railroads actually used to be a tipped industry. Those workers eventually went on strike and they got um, a standard minimum wage and benefits. But for everyone else in the service industry, the federal minimum sub-minimum wage to this day is still $2.13 an hour, which is terrifying. And so like you said, there's a couple states that there's quite a few states that have upped that slightly, but there's still around a dozen 15 states that operate at that federal minimum wage of $2.13, which is just insane. It's insane. And then you couple that minimum wage with the fact that they don't have any of those safety nets like unemployment, social security, health insurance, paid time off and um When I was looking into the economics behind this industry, doing research for the book and realizing that people who work in the service industry age into the most economically disadvantaged population in our country, more so than veterans, it was shocking to see some of those numbers. It was shocking to see that they were twice as likely to experience homelessness, twice as likely to live in poverty, and that the majority of of retired SIPs, which is what I call service industry professionals, it's my acronym, I'm shortening it. Um, live entirely off of Social Security is terrifying when you consider the fact that they likely didn't claim majority of their income because this is an industry that doesn't track their income in the same way that many people don't track their expenses that that meticulously. Um, And that I think it was 2020, the average Social Security check for people who claimed their income in full was around $20,000. Terrifying, terrifying numbers. So, yeah, the the numbers look terrible, but at the same time, I know from my experience and a lot of the people that I know, this industry does not have an income problem. You can make really good money on tips. And so what my experience and the experience of my peers taught me is that it's it's a systems issue. It's a not putting boundaries in place, not understanding the hazards of our environment, not setting up these systems like automation, not setting up our own retirement accounts, not setting up our own PTO. So it was it was in realizing that this that we could set this system up for ourselves where I was like we can change the industry from within. So just out of curiosity, 
since you have a wife who you mentioned is a rock star financial executive. Did you get really into finance and then meet someone in finance or did you meet someone in finance and then get inspired to up your game? So I think this is probably true for most people in corporate finance. They don't care about finances and they have no interest in spending their nine to five in spreadsheets to come home and put their own stuff in spreadsheets. So my wife was like, she had no concept of where our spending was going. She was also somebody who came into her working environment in 2008. She worked for a defense contractor and she watched 50 year old, 60 year old men burst into tears, realizing that they had to work for another 10 years. She was just like, I want no part of that. So she wasn't really investing. She wasn't really paying attention to her finances. She was really kind of living for the day. And that is, and she was working for publicly traded, you know, companies. So I, most people I meet who are in corporate finance are not extreme optimizers in their own lives. When it comes, at least from, from my experience, it's what I see. But she, where she was really helpful to me in writing this book is that most entrepreneurs and people who work in a tip-based income have a fluctuating income. And that's the number one thing I hear when I talk to people about budgeting is, oh, I can't budget. I work off of a fluctuating income. I don't know how much I'm going to make this month. I don't know how much I'm going to, you know, they have no idea. And I said, that's no excuse. Majority of companies don't have consistent income. And every month they still figure out what, what to do. And when I'm talking to people, because I do one-on-one -on -one coaching as well, when I talk to them about how we're going to do a budget, it's the same thing that she does in financial planning and analysis for a Fortune 500 publicly traded company. You look for trends, you make projections, and then you look back on those projections and see how close you were. And that is budgeting, whether you're doing it for your, your family, for your company, or for you know a, a top Fortune 500 company. It's the same process. So often we like to hear how people get to where they are. And some of them have a big corporate job and they leave that to do their own thing, which they already had a ton of training in. Some people go to school for what it is they end up doing. You've pivoted several times and started from nothing and been entirely self-made. So I'm really interested in the meandering path around the country doing service jobs and how that became coupled with construction. I grew up in Washington state. So even when I was a teenager in the early 2000s, our minimum wage was like 11, $12. Now it's over 20. Wow. And so it was never, I mean, neighboring states like Idaho and Montana, it was the other side of the curve. But mm -hmm. I never really thought about that because my first job when I was 15 was pretty sweet <laughs> because it was minimum wage wasn't all that bad. But I would love to hear what it was like, why you moved around and what kind of service jobs you did. Obviously, your bio has some some sizzly uh, copy about, about all different types of service industry. So what kind of stuff did you work in? How did the tip economy train you? Did it take you through your 20s of learning how to save, or were you a day one saver because of that variable income? Yeah, we can go back even even a little bit further. My, my first job was a paper girl at the age of 10. And I remember around the holidays getting dollar bills or $5 bills and just being like, oh my God, I'm so rich. Yes. Um, but I grew up right outside of Detroit. And, you know, my upbringing, we were, we were low middle income. And, you know, my dad worked at the Ford Motor Company plant. He was a assemblyman on the line. My mom was a disabled stay-at-home mom. She left when I was 12. Um, I was left home alone. My dad worked nights. Substance use got really bad. I moved out at the age of 15. Um, I ended up getting kicked out of my high school because I didn't have a permanent address. Ended up registering to, into an alternative high school to be able to graduate from there. Um, when I was 19, my primary parent, my dad had passed away and the house that I grew up in was sold out from underneath me. And I remember I was a receptionist at a general contractor's office. And for some reason I was driving by the house that I grew up in 
And I remember writing the letter and saying like, hey, if you are ever interested in selling this house, is this is the house I grew up in. I didn't want to let it go. And I stuck that note in the door and I got a call from them a couple weeks later. And they were like, well, how much would you be willing to pay for it? And I was like, I don't know. Let me see how much I can get in a mortgage. And this was 2003. So I was able to get a mortgage for twice the amount that the home was sold for. So I ended up purchasing the house I grew up in at the age of 19 for twice the price that it was sold for, taking out 10 credit cards, maxing them out, and renovating the house myself. So I fell in love with construction during this process, and I also got myself in a really bad financial situation. And so at the age of 19, life was just overwhelming and serious and had been really hard for a really long time. And so that was when I was just like, a year after I'd put my heart and soul into this house, I ended up selling it and moving to California. And I needed something easy and I needed something where those creditors weren't chasing me. And so that was how I found the service industry in a full-time way. And I'm so grateful that I stumbled into this industry because I, I tell people this all the time. Everything I know about running a multi-million dollar business, I learned from working in the service industry. I learned how to problem solve. I learned customer service. I learned how to network. I learned time management. I learned how to entertain people. I learned so many vital skills from working behind a bar. And, and every type of bar you can work in, you learn a different skill set, right? If you're in a dive bar, your interpersonal skills are so important. You're having to keep up conversations with so many different types of people all at once. I like to say like the dive bar population is like the comment section in a Facebook post. It is wild out there. Whereas if you're in fine dining, you're handling points of service, you're handling time management. You're, and then if you're in a volume-based business, that's a totally different skill set. And so people who are in the service industry are often very underestimated, but they are very skilled people. And they're often perfect for entrepreneurship because it's the same skills. You have to own your section. You're often, you get to see the beginning, the middle and end of the, of, of the creative experience. You're doing constant back of the envelope math, everything you need to let know in running a business you're doing when you're in the industry. And I have worked every, every type of job. Like I started with when I lived in California, because I was running away from creditors, I was answering Craigslist ads for like catering gigs really random gigs. Um, and that's kind of how I got into some of the more salacious style of the service industry. But from catering to bartending, I was a fetish worker. I was a pole dancer. I was a burlesque dancer, go-go dancer. Um, I was a flair bartender. I was a sideshow showgirl. I was a coyote. I worked at Fenway Park. I worked at Irish pubs. Um, but yeah, you just, it's, you get a lot of experience. Are you, so I have several questions. When you went back to buy your childhood home, were the people that owned it the ones who bought it out of foreclosure or whatever, like the ones who had lived there right after you? Yep. So was that pretty uncomfortable to say that they kind of displaced you? I don't think they knew the ins and outs, right? They were being opportunistic, and I can't fault anyone for that, you know? They weren't, they, they saw the other side of a transaction. They saw a smart buy. Right. Okay. So in the, the, what, maybe 10 years of meandering in the twenties, mm -hmm. what were the best and worst jobs in the service industry? Because when people think service, they most often think waiting tables or bartending, but you just mentioned about 10 different kinds. Yeah. Performing yeah, I mean, and <laughs> people don't think about being a musician or being or being a dancer or being whatever else that recurs working on a cruise ship. There's so many interesting things that people don't really think about in what is considered the service industry. You've done a lot of them and I'd be interested to hear. Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing I'd love to, to, to mention is that this is not a small industry. This 5.5 million people who work on a solar partially, you know, tip based income it is the second largest employment sector in the United States. So, you know, when people complain about tipping, they're like, oh, why don't we just do away with it? And it's like, no, this is a huge, massive, massive industry. And, 
you know, it's people not only just in bars, clubs, and restaurants, but beauty and body services, you know, hairstylists, massage therapists, nail technicians. Those are people who receive tips. People in hospitality, whether you work the front desk, you're a bellman, you're doing ballet, those are tipped positions. If you're in transportation or delivery services, taxi, Uber, you're a mover, you're moving pianos up five flights of stairs, those are tipped positions. So it, it's a massive, massive industry. Now, I've never done hair or driven an Uber and, you know, don't give me your taxi to drive because I, I'm, I'm not, I don't think I'd be great at it. Um, but yeah, I've, I've definitely <laughs> done a number of positions within, within the industry. There's a big overlap between the service industry and also sex work. So some of the more salacious side of the service industry often falls under sex work. And that would be things like the pole dancing and burlesque and, um, you know, cam girling, only fans, that type of stuff. So with the expansion of sex work and it's, it's broadening from dancing in clubs to dancing in front of your computer or doing whatever you're doing in front of your computer, so many people are empowered by this industry and when you were doing those jobs, you couldn't do it in the comfort of your own home. I've read a ton about people who work in the porn industry who are now completely empowered by not having to have an agent or getting all of the money themselves rather than having eight different pockets that it's cut into before it gets to them. What do you think about the several different ways that what is referred to as the sex industry has modernized and that goes beyond things like OnlyFans. That's also Patreon. I mean, it could be podcasters. It could be whatever. I don't necessarily just mean the sex industry, but people love people love hearing about the salacious part. Yeah, it's expanded so much, and it, there's so many things that go into it. You know, like I mean, and when I was doing, you know, sex work, it was it was before OnlyFans. It was before, you know, there was still what I, I call it telehealth, where you could be a phone sex operator still. That was around. Um, but for me, most of my experiences was either in clubs. Um, I worked at a fetish club and um, in private performance. So, like, I was going to people's homes and, you know, or I actually also, this was before me, the Me Too movement, I did a ton of corporate events where I would, you know, be paid to dress up as a dominatrix and go and, you know, pose whipping people's employees or benefactors or donors for large, like, fundraisers. And um, it, there's so many opportunities within this industry. I mean, I remember working as a shadow dancer for a couple guys who were trying to make um, club videos that they wanted to sell to nightclubs. So they wanted to be able to sell DVDs to clubs that would that they could project on the walls that just had a bunch of people dancing. And so that was a very interesting gig that I found on Craigslist that I got paid for. And I remember it being handled, handed like a rubber nipple. Be like, you can put this on before your dance set and... <laughs> I walked out with a fistful of cash. Interesting. There's a uh, fascinating movie. I can't remember if it's Jason Sudeikis. I think it's Ed Helm. It's called The Clapper. And it's about this guy who goes set to set in LA on gig jobs uh, for being the live audience and the people who like when the light comes on, you applaud. Oh, yeah. And it was talking about what it's like to be an extra in movies and just like hang out outside of Universal Studios every day and wait to get called in to sit in the live taped audience or to uh, or to be an extra in the background of, you know, 5000 people at at Grand Central Station or something yeah. or a flash mob participant or whatever. Exactly. There's so many ways to make a living. And I think what's important is just highlighting the fact that all work is work, all work is valid. And the reason I love what you do is because you talk about dream jobs, things that people love to do. And I think that within the service industry, I remember having a, a professor in um, a night college class that I took once, and he told me that hairstylists were the happiest people in the world. And I remember thinking, why is that? And I like, asked him after class and he was like, well, you know, they have autonomy, they have mastery, they're able to, they're location independent, they could have a socialization aspect of it, both like in long-term relationships and short-term relationships. And I remember thinking like, that's a cheat code for life and thinking that there's so many jobs within the service industry that that describes. And I, I, I 
since I've gotten into all of this money stuff, I belong to a bunch of groups called um, Financial Independence Retire Early Groups. And it's a bunch of people who geek out on money stuff and their whole goal is to op optimize their money and retire early. And within this group, there's something called when you retire, the most important time after you retire is the first five years after you retire. And there's something called a sequence of return risk, which, which basically says that if there's a downturn in the market, the first five years after you retire, it's the most dangerous time to see whether or not your retirement money is going to last you for the rest of your life. And so when we're often talking about that, how to, how to minimize a sequence of return risk, people are often like, oh, well, I won't pull out of pull money out in the down market. And so I'll go out and I'll get another job. And I always ask people like, oh, well, what would you do if you had all of this money and you were retired early, but you knew you just had to like have enough money to get by. And they would always say, oh, I would go back to be a bartender. I'd go back to be a waitress. I'd go back to be a barista. And I remember saying like, why? And they'd be like, oh, well, that was the most fun I ever had. And I think that when we talk about lifestyle design and we talk about how to live the life of our dreams or even work the job of our dreams, there's a lot of potential within this, within this industry for people to design their life if they're a little more strategic. I'm curious what you think. That's totally, this is side, side note, but I know someone who did exactly that. He was an orthopedic surgeon for 30 years. And during the pandemic, he just was like, I'm fed up. I'm tired of the hospital. I'm tired of, I mean, his job was often with athletes and things like that. It wasn't necessarily in the ER, but he got a job at Starbucks because they have benefits. And he rolls in at five o'clock in the morning and works the shift and is talking to millennials and working with his hands and getting to know people and just being in that environment most of the people that listen to this podcast are solopreneurs. I run multiple businesses out of hotel rooms, right? And you're just alone a lot. You don't have the water cooler. Everybody wants to work remote. I want to work in a place. Like, mm -hmm. I can't wait to get to the next city so I can roll into a WeWork or something, you know? So, but one of the questions I have that I haven't really had the right person to ask is for people that are in their 60s, 70s that decide to leave their big career job, but they want to keep working what are things that you see people going into? Because if you're 70, you're not exactly doing OnlyFans or maybe not starting a podcast, uh, but you know you don't maybe don't want to be serving. Are there things that that you see people doing in older ages as uh, sole proprietors? I know you coming might not be ready of, for that. But. Coming out of the service industry, so I, what's funny is like I went on. I've been on a couple of retirement podcasts because I've been kind of talking about how people can stay within this industry if you do it for less hours, right? There's a lot of amazing aspects that I think support you at those older ages as long as, you know, I think the reason most people get burned out from these jobs is because they're doing it for 60 hours a week. They're doing it without sleep. They're doing it while juggling a bunch of other things. And this work looks really different when you're doing it for 10, 15 hours. And you are, you're getting that socialization. You're getting to move your body, which at that age is so important to keep you staying active. Um, I would say that the most quintessential retiree job is that Walmart greeter, that person who's, you know, just standing at Walmart and greeting you. And, and that's what you most commonly see. But I, I make a, I make a case that, you know, you want to be a part of your community, go be a hostess, you know, go be a maitre d. You know, you're getting connections with the people in your community. You're getting some opportunities to get a little bit of cash to offset maybe some of your other, whether it's your retirement or your social security or whatever your other investments are. Um, but yeah, I think I think there's a case that could be made for some of these some of these other service industry positions. I think driving my... a taxi is a great way to sit and chat with people. So social. One of my favorite ones is the uh, section leaders at stadiums. Like you get to go to a free baseball game every night and what more fun environment or working at concerts or whatever. I think venues uh, obviously don't discriminate on age or anything. And it's a really cool environment to be in. And they're always hiring people, mm -hmm. but that's an interesting one. So when you got the idea to write a book, you said, you weren't somebody with a financial background. You had made some change. You've purchased homes based on a 
self-employed, which if there are people out there who are not self-employed, it's incredibly difficult. If you want to get a loan of any kind, you typically have to have, what is it, two years of balance two sheets. Years. And it's uh, not easy. I've been self-employed for about 10 years. And you could have months where you make a ton and months where you make negative, And you have to be able to at least show some kind of track record and positive credit, et cetera. So when did you decide to write the book? And what kind of uh, impact has it had since it came out? Has it been received the way you thought it would? Yeah, so the idea kind of for the book came in 2016. Um, like the political world was kind of a mess. And I was like, I, I had so much anxiety. And I was like, I just can't, I can't with any of this. Um, and so I did a media blackout. I did no news, no scrolling, no, no nothing. And all I did was listen to personal finance podcasts. And I have accumulated over 10,000 hours of reading audiobooks and listening of personal finance and finance media. And in digesting all of that, you know, I'm as somebody who's run a number of businesses, as somebody who's worked the books in a number of different positions, when you know the numbers for something, you know the entire business model. Any an entrepreneur will tell you that. When you get good at knowing the numbers, you know the business. And in kind of gut checking all of that information of 10,000 hours, you know, you start to see those patterns and you start to see like, this is what would fit for my community. This was, this is what wouldn't fit for my community. And then I had all of this experience within the industry to kind of make these personal analogies. And I started to get an idea about like, my favorite chapter is my investment chapter because the entire chapter is analogous to being at a bar. If you understand what it's like to be at a bar, you will understand how to invest by the time you're done with this chapter. And so, you know, those ideas just started to like form very slowly. And I probably didn't start like pen to paper until like 18, 2018, 2019, 2020 hit, right? The pandemic hit. And what most people would consider to be a time that would be great for writing, I was actually shut, trying to shut my business down. So like I worked in high-end renovations. That was not happening during the pandemic. Wealthy people didn't want you in, your, in their homes. Oh. So all of our work got shut down. I used to have a mill workshop up in the Bronx. I had to shut that down. So I spent nine months dismantling a business I had built for 10 years. And it was just not a time for me to finish my book. So towards the end of 2020, I finally sent it out to a developmental editor that I found on Upwork. And <laughs> it was really funny because she got on, on a chat with me and she was like, okay. And I think she was so kind. She could tell I had like no, no education. <laughs> and she was just like, every chapter is kind of supposed to feed into the next chapter. And every paragraph within that chapter is supposed to kind of lead to the next. And I was like, oh, and she's like, yeah, that's how you write a book. And I was like, all right, let me try that again. And so like I scrapped the whole book and I rewrote it. And then I spent a year editing and it finally came out in August of 2022. Wow. And so the editing process was long. I'd like to say it was like a year and a half of writing, a year of editing. And now it's been out for about five months and I'm, I'm trying to market and it's self-published. And that was very important to me to self-publish because the whole thing I'm doing in the book is telling people that you can do things non-traditionally and still have success. You can follow this alternative path and still have success. And I wanted to prove that in my own way by saying, I'm going to, I'm going to self-publish this. I have no idea what I'm doing. I've never published a book before, but I'm going to do it because just like everything, you eat the elephant one bite at a time, you figure it out and it's going to be successful. And it has been, I was just named top personal finance book of 2022 by Bruce Celery. Like it was, it's doing really well. Congrats. So I do have a question, and you kind of alluded to early. I don't presume to know what your wife's backstory is or what what adversity she faced on the way up. But in corporate finance, you were mentioning that there are a lot of people who have a mindset kind of make a lot, spend a lot, don't have to worry so much about savings, whereas you came from a background where every dollar mattered, and it was building a long-term future, but it was also out of necessity from day one. What do you commonly see when people get into a relationship, maybe where one is a heavy spender and not saver versus the other? And if your wife's listening to this, I don't mean to be unfair. I just totally, totally not about you guys. But I've been in a few relationships like that. And in this world, especially if you want to buy a house or get a loan, it's way easier to be part of a two than part of a one. 
But when you're integrating systems, especially when they're deeply rooted in in your your values at this point, I mean, it is part of your lifestyle. How do you uh, integrate maybe if you were with somebody who has that other lifestyle? This is such a great question because I, I spend a lot of time around um, other financial coaches and financial advisors and their number one tip is always like, oh, have a money date where you and your partner talk about money for one hour a week. And I'm just like, first of all, if you have two people who have very different ideas about, you know, they approach money different, very differently, right? Like one may be avoidant while the other one is really, you know, drilled into it, or someone might have financial trauma in their past. Someone might have a big, you know, a lot of scarcity and have a lot of fear surrounding it. No one's going to just sign up for a financial date. And so how I approached it, since my, me and my wife have very different strategies and approaches to money is I would, on the weekend, we'd be cleaning. I would put on a financial podcast and there would always be like some sort of topic that would get us talking. And because we're talking about this totally separate couple or this totally separate conversation piece, it's not heated. It's not about our money. It's not about our situation. And we could sort of have the conversations that we needed to have about money, but without all of that heat and fire where it's like, oh, well, these are my values and this is what's important to me or I deserve this. And so that's sort of how we did it. We did not share money for the first five years of our marriage. And I think that was a huge mistake because we enabled each other in a lot of ways. You know, she'd be like, oh, I had a good week. Or like, you know, I'd be like, I made $1,000 tonight. We're going out, you know, whereas if we had aligned our goals earlier on, um, and that's not to say every couple needs to do that, right? Um, but for us, I think we really could have made a lot more progress had we been on the same page early on. But yeah, so that's my recommendation for couples is like a money date is it's hard to get there. So approach it in different ways. Um, one of the biggest pieces of advice I tell people who are in the service industry is don't date somebody at your establishment because you need income diversification. And if you're both working at the same restaurant or club and you, you know, the restaurant goes out of business, the club goes out of business, whatever goes out of business, then you're both screwed, you know? And so make sure that you're trying to diversify either within establishments or across industries or, you know, it's the same thing when two people who are running a business together are only working on the business. And it's like, that's very scary for both of you to have your income in this one business. Um, so look for other ways to bring in additional income. I've always wondered because it seems like traditional suggestions, I mean, there's there's so many different routes, right? A lot of people will put all of the money they make in and say, it doesn't matter if we have different incomes and then we each can take X amount out for discretionary spending. My ex-wife and I got together pretty young and we both had pretty substantial income and we did exactly the opposite. We'll both put in enough to cover our expenses and some savings, but you spend your money how you want, I'll spend my money how I want. And... A couple of years later, when I decided to quit my corporate job and start a brewery and I didn't pay myself for three years, the dynamic didn't change from the initial plan that we made. That wasn't our undoing. I, things were fine. But you don't think about having a, a regular summit about how you're going to continue to handle money. And we had a, a very weird kind of... Uh, I don't want to say a gender norm thing, but I was still paying for all of our nights out and our vacations and gifts and whatever. And I was making a tenth of what she was and just plowing through savings to try to keep up with the way we were when we were first together. And that's yeah. not to say anything about people's roles in a marriage or whatever, but it's to say you should have regular check-ins on planning or how you expect to grow together. Because at some point, your discretionary money could be a ton on either side or both. And then you're wondering when the other person wants to buy a new car and they don't really have to ask you uh, how you end up. And that sounds like kind of unsuccessful uh, uh, partnership. But yeah. the other thing is people are really enabled to be self-employed when their spouse has a traditional 401k nine to five job because they might have benefits, et cetera. Two people who are both in the service industry, you kind of have to have your shit together regardless yeah. how much you're making. A hundred percent. Yeah, I'll recommend a podcast. Um, I believe it's Ramit Sethi. He does this, at, like, where he gets couples to come on and fight about money. Um, and that's super interesting because 
you can watch somebody else's argument and be like, oh, I would have handled it this way. And then again, you're just taking the heat out of it. And it's a good way for two people to kind of see where they align and where maybe they need a little more conversation. So now you are running a successful construction company. Congrats on making it through the pandemic. Uh, Thank you. I imagine that was a, a testing time. And you've written a book about finance. You work in finance. You coach people in finance. You speak in finance. You're on a crazy podcasting tour. I understand you're trying to do 100, and I'm somewhere in the 30s. Uh, yep. Thank you for your time. What are you hoping to do in the next several years with either as a coach, speaker, author, or as an entrepreneur in multiple industry sectors? Yeah, I'm a little burnt out from, you know, I think shutting my business down, restarting my business, the publishing of the book, this tour. So I think I'm going to kind of take a gap year soon um, and then see what's next. I I love the idea of writing another book. Um, I definitely know I have that in me. I'm not really sure what it's, where it's going to be focused, but I spend a long time working in the service industry and I'm really passionate about helping these people because I think they're really underserved. And so I really want to give everything I've got to this book because I think it's going to change lives when it gets in the right, in the right hands. And so for the next couple of months to a year, I really want to focus on pushing, pushing the book and doing more talks. Like I give corporate talks now to like, if you own a bar or a club, or if you own Uber, I will come and talk to your staff about how to manage their money because I think that helps with retention. And I think that help when you have retention, it helps your business. You know, 90% of owners of businesses within the service industry are mom and pop. They're small operators. And what we know about this industry is that they run on really slim margins. And when we talk about owners of the service industry, it's not the owners from post-Civil War that are trying to profit off of, you know, minorities. These are good people that took their love and passion for food or wine or, uh, you know, points of service or women or whatever. And they sunk their money into a, into a business to support their community and hopefully fulfill their dreams. And so I'm not just here for the employees, but I'm also here for the employers because when our service-based establishments succeed and do well, our communities do well. Our real estate valuations are propped up by these businesses. We need them to succeed. And so, you know, I'm passionate about the economics behind all of it. It's funny when you see in the movies, I think it was probably popularized by the internship uh, with Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson. But when people look at these big corporate campuses or co-working spaces like we work, where the free muffins seem so amazing or the unlimited tea, like we're talking about hot water here, right? Mm -hmm. And that costs the company nothing as a line item against how many employees they have. So something as simple as financial, personal financial management training in any industry is so weird that it hasn't always been packaged in your benefits, in your professional training of what to do with your money. I recently interviewed someone who does uh, mergers, layoffs, and and acquisitions, and the she trains people in the culture change that happens as a result to any significant shift. And... She was telling me all about when somebody gets fired, you equally kind of have to nurture the people who she called them survivors. You know, if a manager gets fired and they had a bunch of people under them, those people are glad they still have their job, but they're also having a huge hole in their in their world. And they don't provide training for people after they get fired or what to happen if it doesn't work out here or when companies come together, if you're worried that you're redundant, there just aren't, isn't conversation. And it would seem like something about what to do your money with your money when you get a paycheck two times a month or every single night if you get a wad of cash doing whatever it is you do. It's um, it's very difficult. And I have no idea if if OnlyFans issues 1099s or you know whatever it is. But there are people with extremely substantial income that still don't know what to do with it. And that's also pretty scary that you have people that are getting rich on TikTok and YouTube, uh, but they might not be accounting for it properly. Or uh, at some point, the IRS is going to get fired up about content creators. You know what I mean? So on that note, Barbara, you wrote a book. And I typically like to ask people, what books or podcasts would you suggest? Clearly, we're putting yours at the head. It's going to be in the link right below us. If you're watching or if you're listening, it'll be in the show notes. But 
is Ramit Sethi's I'll Teach You to Be Rich. A lot of people say that's a good place to start. What kind of stuff are you into uh, telling people who might be starting on this journey in terms of podcasts or books or whatever? Yeah, I, I, I listened to Ramit Sethi's podcast. Um, I've skimmed his book. I think he and I are a little different in some of our approaches. Um, so I'm not sure I'd give his a, his, his a recommend or an endorsement um, because, you know, he, I, when we're talking to low and middle income people, small amounts have potential to add up. So when you talk to Ramit, Ramit's really focused on those high earners, those people who have a lot of resources and he's like, live big, spend ridiculously on the things that are important to you and cut everything else ruthlessly, which is great. But for some people who don't have that bandwidth or don't have that, when we're talking about low and middle income people, um, those, those small things can really add up. And so okay. I so I have a question. I don't mean to interrupt, mm -hmm. but this no, is, no, no, go for it. this is hot breaking news. Uh, so that really reminded me of something. A lot of people at, in all forms of their career get inspired by like the rich dad, poor dad kind of stuff, or, um, who is the guy who does the real estate stuff? Um, his daughter now does it too. And their whole platform is based on how much you can borrow and how you can accumulate wealth by our system in our country being <sighs> real estate. You know, your value often accrues more than a than a, an account would in a bank. But do you find that people get the wrong advice. So there's people like Ramit Sethi or Nicole Lapin that are huge in social media and have become big in the cultural zeitgeist. But as you said, they might work for millennials who have jobs with more disposable income or whatever. People want to consume things that are on online, whereas some more traditional financial systems are a little less sexy or exp have as much exposure. Uh, what do you see as the biggest problem in people getting not the best or the most broad financial advice before we get the good ones. Yeah. I mean, I think Dave Ramsey paved Dave Ramsey, the way that's for, it. He, he, he paved the way for all of us to be here. It wasn't an industry before we got here, but frankly, I think the guy's a prick, right? Like I think he's, he's a, he's a bigot. And I think like he sells people on mutual funds and makes more off of them. And you know, he's, he's predatory. So I'm not, I'm not a Dave Ramsey fan. I also don't think you should be hawking your religion when you're quote unquote trying to, to help people with their money. Um, that being said, he paved the way and he has helped a lot of people. Um, and I think that what's great about right now is that there's a lot of different voices and there's a lot of ways to find those various different voices. So yeah, I think that you, you should be looking for more tailored advice. Ramit is definitely the person, if you're in big tech and you get a big paycheck and you have a lot of disposable income, his advice is going to be spot on. He's not going to, he's going to say, maybe you don't need a budget. We'll call it a spending plan. Whereas like the people I'm working with one, they're going to see through that. They're going to be like, don't call it a spending plan. It's a fucking budget. <laughs> like, sure. You know, they're going to see right through that. They're going to call bullshit. And you know, I'm dealing with very skeptical people who need more coaching on the hazards of their workplace. They need to know how to set up boundaries. They're dealing with the general public. The general public is terrible. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of advice out there. And, you know, I think what's great is that you have a lot of, there's a lot of options. So find somebody who's talking specifically to you and that can direct their advice to your situation you know, I didn't find anyone else who was talking to tipped people, but I hope that this shows people that there's a big group of people out there to be served and that they should make their voices known. Do you think you're going to create education products in the future that can reach to individuals? You mentioned you work with corporate teams and with companies, but are you going to have online courses or are you going to continue to write books? Is that the best form? I'd love to produce a course. I have no idea how to do that. So that means something I'd have to teach myself. I'm, I'm sure I'm capable of it. Um, but I guess I would want to talk to my, to my audience and see if that's where, where they, where the need is, right? Like I think some people learn differently. Some, I, I hope a book is one of the ways that my audience learns, you know, like I need to record the audiobook, you know, like, which I think is going to cost me about five or $6,000. So I just need to find like a recording studio and 
put some of those things in place to do the audiobook next. Um, but people learn in a lot of different ways. And so that's what's great about what you're doing. You're providing a podcast where people can learn a lot of different things by listening to something for an hour. There's podcasts, there's blogs, there's books, there's books on, on, on you know, we have a lot of ways to get information. I'm not sure what I'll do next. I'm inspired by you. I'm inspired by everybody. Thank you. I feel a weird amount of pressure in that in that layer. I think I work with a lot of coaches and authors, and there are a lot in this community. But I recently wrote a book. It hasn't come out yet. But I've been getting hammered by people to, when is your e-course coming out? When is your coaching program work coming out? How many more speaking gigs are you going to pick up? What's your lead magnet? How much free shit are you giving away? How much video are you doing? And you can't just be an author or just be a speaker. You have to be author, speaker, podcaster, event host, and all of these things in order to be a, a storyteller. And I find that refreshing that you're like, I'll figure it out later. It doesn't all have to come at the same time. I mean, for me, this is super mission-based. Like, I want to get this word out. If I could if I could make this book 99 cents and people would take it seriously, then I would because I think the information is that important that it needs to get out there. But people don't value books that are 99 cents. They only value books that are $15. And so you have to price them. The market will bear what the market bears, right? And so you have to you have to price along the market. My whole point is that all of this information is DIY. You can find all of this information out there. So do I need to sell a course to get this information out there? No, I don't. And I don't think anyone should. Should you make money off your business in whatever ways your audience serves you? Yeah, you should. You should listen to your audience. They'll tell you what they want. Um, but to do it just to do it, that doesn't seem that doesn't seem like the next journey for me, not unless my audience is telling me that that's what they need because they can get this information for free from me in a, in a, in a wide variety of ways. I love that. Follow, follow me at tip finance. I'll put it in a, I'll put it in a meme. I'll, you know, go live and go on a rant and um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of ways to this information. Okay, great. So in order to stick the landing, there's a couple things we got to do. Yeah. The first one is what is something right now in your professional or personal life that you are proud of? America is listening. I'm proud of my book. I'm very proud of my book. There it is. There it is. Love the cover too. Um, it's super fun. The budgeting chapter is fun. I compare budgeting to things I learned while I was a fetish worker. There's a, a, there's a bunch of ways to build an abundance mindset. I'm super proud of my work, my, my book. It was a lot of work. It was a labor of love. I'm passionate about helping these people. Yeah, I'm really proud of it. That's awesome. And I asked you 10 minutes ago, and then I interrupted you, what books or podcasts would you suggest other than yours that are a good starting point generally for people? Yeah, the two podcasts I started listening to that started me down this journey was So Money by Farnoosh Tarabi and Afford Anything by Paula Pant. I really like Farnoosh Tarabi. She's awesome. She and I went to stand-up school at the same same place. Really? So we both did stand-up sets at Gotham Comedy Club. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been to Gotham. Okay, so the last thing is then, how can people follow you, consume your content, buy your book? What are all the links and places? Yeah, so the book's available on Amazon. You can type in tipped or tipped book. Um, if service industry financial advice is not your jam, pick it up for your favorite bartender. Pick it up for your hairstylist. Pick it up for anyone who you care about or enjoy who works in the service industry. Because I'll say this, they don't know that they need it, but they need it. Um, you can find me and follow me on all the socials at Tipped Finance. You can reach out to me at my website, www.tippedfinance. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. If you want to recommend me to do a corporate speaking gig or you want me to come to your establishment and do a dirty money talk for your staff, I will so do that. And do you travel for that too? I do travel for that. Yeah. Cool. I would like that. Okay, great. All those links are going to be uh, in the descriptions below. Barbara, it's been so great. Thank you so much for your time. Andy, this is a lot of fun. Excellent. Have a great day. This has been a production of the Dream Jobs podcast from Daydreamer Network. Our head producer is Jessica Carmen. Thanks to everyone on our team. Thanks to our audience. Thanks to Barbara. Have an excellent day, and we'll talk to you next time.